The 2015 Progress Seminar invited people of San Mateo County from local business, government, and community leaders to take a weekend retreat for networking, brainstorming, and meeting on community issues. Breakout session topics included, what can we do to move the needle? Keeping community in an era of income inequality. What's working in retail and why? Bridging the gap. Transportation big and small, moving toward the future. California, we need to talk. California Water Crisis Group Exercise. And now, on to the 2015 Progress Seminar. Welcome everyone. 46th Annual Progress Seminar, so thank you very much for being here. Um, This is one of the largest seminars with an extraordinary program today, which we are really excited about. We think this program will be one that everyone will be talking about during the months to come. We really appreciate everyone giving us their weekend, as it is what makes this seminar what it is, each of you bringing and sharing your expertise and perspective with everyone else. We are so proud of the Progress Seminar, an event that is certainly unique to our county, and one which other counties everywhere would like to emulate. The Progress Seminar has certainly grown, and that would not be, the poss would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, who are sitting with me at the head table this morning, and we want to thank all of our sponsors who really recognize the value of what a weekend like this can accomplish, and we appreciate it all so much. And please, do not hold your applause for these individuals and these companies. <laughs> We're certainly going to, we're going to start to my left. Jill Singleton, Cargill Premier Seminar Sponsor. <laughs> Barry Gillette, President, CEO, San Mateo Credit Union, Premier Seminar Sponsor. <laughs> Mary Huss, Publisher, San Francisco Business Times, Media Sponsor. Aaron Moses, Community Engagement Manager, Facebook, Principal Seminar Sponsor. <laughs> Jerry Hill, California State Senator, and he'll be our second keynote speaker. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> I apologize. I skipped over Stacy Wagner, Director of Public Affairs, Kaiser Permanente, <laughs> Opening General Session Sponsor. Carol Groom, seminar co-chair, president, San Mateo County, Board of Supervisors, and she'll be our first keynote speaker. And I think I said this last year, introducing the podium, which I'm right here. Uh, Roseanne Faust, seminar co-chair, vice mayor, city of Redwood City, president and CEO, Sam Sita. Kevin Mullen, seminar co-chair, California State Assembly member. Lenny Gutierrez, Director of Government Affairs, South Bay and Peninsula, Comcast, Seminar Signature Sponsor. Thank you, Lenny. <laughs> Sue Vaccaro, Senior Director of Government Affairs, Comcast, Seminar Signature Sponsor. <laughs> and last but not least, Scott Hart, Government Relations Representative, Pacific Gas and Electric, Premier Seminar Sponsor. So in your program, um, you will see that we have everyone's bios. This will save time during the breakouts and general sessions, giving more time to the actual conversations and the keynote speakers. So in that way, at this time, I would like to thank Roseanne Faust, Carol Groom, and First Time Progress Seminar Co-Chair Kevin Mullen for the fantastic job they did along with their committee in putting this program together. So thank you. Uh, I've been given a quick announcement. Peninsula TV is here shooting our sessions during uh, the breakouts, and they'll be doing short interviews 
You're invited to stop in at their booth and talk about the progress seminar and the topics and the issues that we're discussing today. So thank you very much. With that, I'd like to uh, bring up Roseanne Faust to continue the program. Thank you. So we're going to be doing this a few times over the weekend. But first and foremost, I want to thank our two-time chair of the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber Board of Directors, Gino Gasparini. I would also like to th thank this seminar really could not be possible without Amy Buckmaster and her team at the chamber, and we owe them a huge round. So what I'd like to do now is if the names of the folks that I call could please stand up, I would really appreciate it. And I am gonna go very quickly, so I need your attention. Caitlin Adair, Lynn Kathleen Adams, Scott Adams, Aaron Acknon, John Baker, Jonathan Bissell, am I seeing you get up? Rick Bonilla, Mike Bordoni, Carmelita Botello, Matthew Butler, Cindy Chavez, Judith Christensen, Deb Golden, I'm sorry, Colden, David Demarest, John Diaz, Karen Irvin, Mike O'Neill, Marianne Osberg, Fergus O'Shea, Nicole Pollock, Gary Pollard, Laura Richardson, Deborah Ruddick, James Rugomez, Tony Seabury Murray, Lorraine Simmons, Monique Binkley Smith, Reverend Kirsten Snow Spaulding, Lauren Sweezy, Debbie Tavi, Judy Taylor, Brent Tejan, Shirley Terrell. Michelle Vilchez, Alan Weiner, and Dennis L. Are you all standing? These are our first time attendees to the Progress Seminar. So the deal is folks, tonight, during the cocktail hour, Okay, I'm being clear on this. During the cocktail hour, I'm asking all you folks that have been here before, please buy the first time attendees a drink during the cocktail hour. Okay, keep that in mind. So now I'd like to, our mayor's table. We have our mayor's table, where are our mayors? I see some of them. Kat Carlton, Mayor City of Menlo Park. Ron Collins, Mayor City of San Carlos. Karen Irvin, Mayor City of Pacifica. Marina Frazier, Mayor Half Moon Bay. Maureen Frache, Mayor City of San Mateo. Lisa Gaucher, Mayor East Palo Alto. Jeff G, Mayor City of Redwood City. And Robert Gottschalk, Mayor City of Millbrae. And Art Kiesel, Mayor City of Foster City. Not bad, folks. Yay! And it's wonderful to have our chamber executives here today. We have them from all over San Mateo County. We have Cheryl Angeles, Amy Buckmaster, Mitch Bull, Fran Dean, Maria Martinucci, Jamie Monzen, Georgette Taylor, Debbie Tavey. But we'd also like to thank Dave Bouchard, Charisse McHugh, and Courtney Conlon, who could not be with us here today, and Johan Bohegian from Foster City. So thank you to all of our chamber executives for supporting the Progress Seminar. Are you folks woken up yet? Let's go, San Mateo County. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna bring up my just wonderful friend, our assembly member, someone that I think we feel so good is in Sacramento at this point, assembly member Kevin Mullen, who will make further introductions.
Thank you so much, Roseanne. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our first of two keynote addresses this morning. And Supervisor Carol Groom will be uh, providing us the state of the county. Carol Groom was elected to the Board of Supervisors in June 2010 and served as president of the board in 2011. Prior to Supervisor Groom's appointment in 2009, she served for nine years on the San Mateo City Council, including ter two terms as mayor and on the San Mateo Planning and Public Works Commission. Supervisor Groom's legislative priorities include access to health care for all, environmental protection, maintaining and preserving our county's parks and growing our local economy. In 2009, she originated the Streets Alive, Parks Alive uh, program, a countywide event for which she was awarded the 2012 Champion of the Community Award by the California Parks and Recreation Society. She currently serves on the boards of directors of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, the San Mateo County Transportation Authority, and the San Mateo County Transit District. We know it as SamTrans. In December 2012, she was appointed to the California Coastal Commission by our then Assembly Speaker, John Perez. How lucky we are to have a Coastal Commissioner that hails from San Mateo County on that board. Uh, her, yes, give that a round of applause. <laughs> from the from the coastal contingent over here in particular. Uh, her professional experience includes 18 years as Vice President of Mills Peninsula Health Services. She also volunteers on the boards of directors of the San Mateo Police Activities League, Community Gate Path, and Leadership San Mateo, and on the advisory board of PalCare, a nonprofit school and childcare center. She resides in the city of San Mateo. Carol's a dedicated public servant. We're fortunate to have her leadership. Please join me for the State of the County Address, Supervisor Carol Groom. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here and serving on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. Um, and most of all my colleagues are here this morning, which is very nice to see you. Um, so let me start by telling you that uh, the state of the county is good. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's always prudent to use caution. And I really enjoy Governor Brown's phrase of prudent exuberance. <laughs> so we are financially healthy. We're fortunate to have um, many of you supported it, the Measure A sales tax, which allowed us to restore a number of services in the county that we had had to cut over the last few years. Property tax is very strong. Sales tax at SFO is excellent and we have very healthy reserves. But we can never take anything for granted, as you all know. Once the, the economy could dip again, and we'd all be hustling to find extra funds to continue to do the services that we're required to do. So in the past few years, we have worked very hard on our infrastructure. Uh, we're, as you, we're opening a new jail in the spring of 16, which will allow us to do the kind of rehabilitation services that we have tried to do for, the, for many years, but just simply didn't have the space. By doing better rehabilitation services, we will get people back into the community again, hopefully to be productive citizens. We've built some new fire stations, and we're planning to redo some fire stations, uh, especially in the unincorporated area. We had things, we had fire stations that are not seismically safe, and we've been able to, to work on that. We have studied and have come up with a number of solutions for the Pescadero flooding situation, an intolerable, an intolerable situation for that community. And under Don Horsley's leadership, we are finally going to solve a 40-year problem. We're also going to be... <laughs> We're also going to be able to rebuild the road at Surfers Beach on Highway 1. Done a number, a lot of... <laughs> Thank Don on the way out. Um, we've been able to do, we're starting some infrastructure work in North Fair Oaks, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. But we have spent a, pretty much the last couple of years working on infrastructure. The county's goals, no matter what year we're in, really tend to remain the same. It's to keep San Mateo a healthy and secure and safe community, provide services for the most vulnerable of populations, 
preserve and protect our precious open space and parklands, and maintain a strong fiscal position, balanced budget, and healthy reserves. Through 2014 and 15, uh, we all have worked on a number of special projects that we, keep, we'll keep, that we think will keep San Mateo County prosperous and well positioned for the future. Dave is leading the way, Dave Pine is leading the way for sea rise and flooding issues. Hopefully we'll be able to help many of our communities get out of, get out of FEMA trouble. Um, I want to, and um, Supervisor Tissier, Adrian and Don again have been working on a project called Beyond Newtown along with Superintendent of County Schools, Ann Campbell and Sheriff Greg Monks. We have worked, uh, they have been able to come up with more sheriff presence on school campuses, say, making sure that our school campuses are a little safer, and enhanced information sharing between all the parties involved, as well as um, enhanced mental services and counseling services, especially for children. We all said the day after Newtown occurred, we're going to do the damnedest, the darndest things we can do so that Newtown will not happen in San Mateo County. Supervisor Slocum, Warren has led the way on the revitalization and, and renaissance of North Fair Oaks. This is a community that's right in, our, in, in the center of our county. Um, they have a developed a, a really comprehensive plan was developed. Um, we have spent about $12.5 million to begin to redo the, the North Fair Oaks section of Middlefield Road between Atherton and Menlo Park. Uh, Warren and his staff have been literally spending hours and hours working with the North Fair Oaks community so that we can bring this vibrant community back to the state that it needs to be in. Um, a number of us have been working on a project called the Big Lift, which is a third grade reading initiative. I th I we talked about it last year at the Progress Seminar. We have a number of children in our community who are not reading when they arrive at third grade. We, we think that the solution to this is two years of quality preschool so that children will arrive at kindergarten ready to learn. And all of us, Anne and I uh, and Erica Wood from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Foundation are proud to announce that in September, we will have four school districts beginning two years of quality preschool. Cabrillo. South San Francisco, Jefferson, and Pescadero. A couple of new projects that we're taking on. Um, some of you have been attending some meetings. Uh, Dave and I are working on getting this county ready to accept community choice aggregation. Uh, working with PG&E, we will be able to bring more renewable energy to this county. Um, all 20 of our cities have opted to participate with us in the first step, which is working with PG&E to get the, the grid load so that we'll know exactly what kind of energy we use and what kind of energy we will need in, in the future. We're very excited about that. We have a brand new Office of Sustainability in San Mateo County, and they, the staff of that is, is leading the way. The last thing that we're going to take on this year, we think, is uh, try, we try to do something about housing in this county. Every, one, every city struggles, the county struggles. We've done a couple of workshops, and so we are going to form in the next couple of months a countywide blue ribbon task force on housing. And many of you in this room will be asked to serve. And let's see if together we can't solve this problem, get some affordable housing for the people. We want people to live in this community who work here. We want people to be able to quit commuting. So we're going to try, as, as a unit, to take this off. You've all heard me say this before. This is the greatest place in the world to live and to work and to raise a family. And the fact that you're all here today means that you agree with that, I hope, and that we want to do whatever we can to make sure that San Mateo County remains strong, it remains vibrant, it remains a good place to be educated and a good place to work. And I think that's what the five of us are trying to accomplish. 
um, every day, and we, we want you to join us because obviously all of us do better than just one of us. So I'm again glad to tell you that I think the state of the county is pretty good and we have a lot of work to do, but together we're gonna get it done. Thank you again. So now it's my, again my pleasure to introduce California State Senator Jerry Hill. Now he needs no introduction because you all know him, you all know how hard he works, you all know that he's always here to, to lend a hand. In fact, one of the things that there's no doubt that we have the best dele Sacramento legislative delegation in the state. So Jerry joined the California State Senate in 2012 with a strong track record of leadership that includes over 20 years of public service as an elected official. He was the mayor of the city of San Mateo. He served on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors and he was a member of the state assembly. While serving in local government, he helped preserve thousands of acres of open space, worked to establish one of the state's first anti-smoking ordinances helped expand health care coverage for over 17,000 children in San Mateo County, and led efforts to create a new homeless shelter in San Mateo County. Taking office in the assembly in 2008, he quickly established himself as a thoughtful and dynamic state lawmaker. His legislation signed while in the assembly saved the state millions of dollars through increased efficiency, improved gas pipeline safety, qualified the state for national popular vote, cracked down on repeat DUI offenders, underage drinking on party buses, and on retailers who sell tobacco to minors, brought solar jobs to this region. While in the Senate, he has continued his commitment to the peninsula through legislation that was signed to ensure access to Martins Beach, increase safety at the PUC and PG&E, and to allow vote by male voters to verify that their vote was confirmed. Jerry grew up in the Bay Area, helping his father run a small business. He still owns that business, which provides jobs to local residents. He attended public schools, graduated from UC Berkeley, has a teaching credential from San Francisco State University, and he and Sky live in San Mateo. Please welcome Senator Hill. I'm gonna move this if I can. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carol, for that wonderful introduction. I, I really appreciate always being with Carol Groom because uh, there is no one, and she was kind enough to say that I work hard, but there's no one that works harder. And you heard the list of the commissions that she's on, and really the Coastal Commission was a, was a biggie. And I remember when we were hoping, trying to make that happen in Sacramento, uh, and it did because we needed a voice of reason on the Coastal Commission, and, uh, and we got it with Carol, so that was a good thing, so thank you. For that. It's hard to believe when I hear this, is the 46th year of the Progress Seminar, and uh, I was thinking back, and I can't believe that that's uh, my 23rd or fourth year, which amazes me, so all of you uh, first-timers who are here this year, just remember, uh, uh, it was only yesterday, it seemed like I was sitting there for that first time, so it goes fast, but what an opportunity, uh, and a great, uh, just it's tremendous what the Chamber does and how they bring this together, and I always thought it was better to do it in San Mateo. I was one of those people that said, no, we shouldn't go to Monterey, we should stay home, we should bring the, keep the money in our county and do that. And, uh, how quickly after the first seminar I came to, I realized I was wrong. Um, <laughs> didn't take long because uh, you wouldn't be sitting here this morning if we were back in San Mateo County. I know it. You'd be off doing something else as I would be because there's always something else that seems more important. And so this is great. So thank you for keeping it together and keeping it here. It's wonderful. Um, the other thing is I just wanted to highlight how fortunate I am and fortunate that you, you all felt uh, that it was uh, important to elect uh, Kevin Mullen to the State Assembly. He's a great colleague and someone we're all proud of working with. It's always nice to have a friend in Sacramento. There aren't many, but it's nice to have one anyway. <laughs> um, 
you know, you know, I know one of the themes for the Progress Seminar this year, and it has been, is sustainability. And many of the issues that the governor and, and my colleagues uh, have, been, have before us are kind of keys to and of sustainability. How we manage water, address climate change, and support education are just a few of the issues that are crucial to California's sustainable future. As leaders of our county, our cities, and our communities, you face these issues as well. Today, I'd like to talk about a topic that also is vital to our sustainable future. It's an issue that uh, we all must face and a responsibility I believe we all share. Safeguarding the rights to civilian oversight, privacy, and other civil liberties as we strive for a safer environment. We have the great good fortune on the peninsula to live and work in, as we know, the cradle of innovation. I don't have to tell you that our region is the birthplace of many of the world's most influential and innovative companies, sitting right on the dais with Facebook. We are living proof that the Internet of Things is more than just a concept. The peninsula, peninsula is filled with businesses, communities, and everyday people who, who have firsthand experience with smart buildings, smart homes, smart cars, smart appliances, smart personal devices that provide us with a seamless and continuous connections to our homes, our loved ones, and our offices, if we want. If we choose, we can see them and they can see us in real times as we live our lives daily. I emphasize the words, if we choose, because in the situations I just described, we are aware of and we largely control our level of engagement, what information we access, what information we share, and with whom we share it. We decide whether to let our friends and associates or the public know where we go, when we arrive, how long we stay, who is with us, and where we're going next. It might be a huge surprise to many people in our communities and perhaps to some of us here today to learn that such detailed information is being collected about us without our knowledge and consent as we go about our everyday lives. The information is collected by people we don't know, and it's accessible in a matter of keystrokes by strangers. As individuals, we have no choice in the matter. And in far too many cases, neither have the local governments and communities around the country where the data collection is taking place. I'm talking about the acquisition and the use of powerful surveillance technician technologies by law enforcement and certain private companies that are collecting data with little or no oversight. And it's occurring with a deeply troubling consequence, the erosion of safeguards for civil liberties and privacy in the name of public safety. Cutting edge surveillance technology includes automatic license plate readers, a combination, which is, a, as you know, a high-speed cameras and software that automatically scan any license plate within range up to 2,000 plates a minute. The devices take a photo of a vehicle's license plate and record the date, time, and location of the car. It's estimated that 75% of law enforcement agencies in the United States use license plate readers. 85% of the departments that have the devices plan to expand their use. And within the next five years, at least 25% of all police vehicles are expected to be equipped with the technology. License plate readers are often acquired and deployed by law enforcement agencies without, without the approval of their local governments. Just as disturbing, many agencies operate these devices without establishing rules to ensure that the information collected is used and stored in a way that respects individuals' privacy and their civil liberties. Nationally, at least half of the police department the departments that use license plate readers do not have such policies in place. Even though these tools capture millions of pieces of information from the vehicles that pass within their range, whether or not those cars or their drivers are suspected of any wrongdoing. The information collected is aggregated and stored in immense databases. For example, most Northern California police departments use license plate readers who use them, store the data collected in the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, the NICRIC for short. Last year, the center had more than 100 million individual license plate data points in its database. You may be wondering 
Where are these devices used in the peninsula? Well, police departments in Daly City, San Mateo, Redwood City, East Palo Alto, and Menlo Park, and the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office have license plate readers. In Santa Clara County, police in Palo Alto, Los Altos, and Mountain View are among the law enforcement agencies that use the devices. The councils of Hillsborough and San Carlos are considering whether to purchase the devices today. In some, but not all, of the communities where the technology is used. The issue went before city councils with opportunities for public comment. Similarly, some of the police agencies with the devices have basic use and privacy policies in place. I realize many of you may say, wait, I know the police chief in these cities. I work with them. I trust them. Our sheriff currently chairs the executive committee of the NICRIC, and the technology seems like a strong crime-fighting tool. And I, too, have worked with police, chiefs, sheriffs in our region on an ongoing basis for the last 23 years. And I have a lot of faith in the great work they do. But last week, while speaking with one of the chiefs in our county, the chief negatively referenced my license plate reader legislation that I have in Sacramento, and we'll talk about that in a while. Then added, didn't your home get burglarized a few years ago? As if that were justification for anything law enforcement wants to do. Law enforcement in San Mateo County has done a good job keeping our communities safe, and we don't want to prevent them from doing their jobs. But their jobs need to be balanced with the rights and liberties afforded us in our Constitution. However, I must emphasize that there is an important difference between interpersonal trust in our professional relationships and the public trust vested in each and every elected official. The elected officials joining us, joining us today know that we are responsible for civilian oversight in our communities. We are responsible for upholding the public trust, and we are responsible for preserving the rights and the civil liberties of our residents. The, the decisions about whether to use advanced technology for broad data collection and how to use and store the vast amounts of information harvested should not be made by the agencies that want to operate the devices. Just like GPS, license plate readers make it easy for anyone, whether it's law enforcement, a private company, or an individual to track and monitor the whereabouts of any person. Here are some examples of how the powerful technology has been misused. In New York City, police use license plate readers to monitor residents attending a local mosque. In Virginia, police use license plate readers to track residents attending political rallies. In Boston, a police officer used a license plate reader to find a woman he had met while on duty. When I started looking into this issue, I was curious about what this technology can do. And so I said, so I said, I want to know where my wife's been. So with her permission, <laughs> to make sure that's clear right now, I hired a private investigator to find her and to find her car. And they put my wife's license plate in the, in the database. Here comes back. I found a picture of her car, the back, the whole back of her car, at a location that she goes to regularly, and uh, with the longitude, latitude, address, and this was on private property where that picture was taken. So if you used this technology like that on a regular basis, you could detect patterns you could see where people are going, with whom, and how often. You could build a personal profile of law-abiding private citizens without a legitimate reason to do so. License plate readers can be a useful crime-fighting tool, and we've seen it in action, and they work extremely well. But the, tech, the, but the technology is evolving faster than our lives. Another example is cell phone intercept technology. This new high-tech police tool is better known by, it has a number of brand names, the one most popular is Stingray. The device is the size of a briefcase and allows law enforcement agencies to track cell phones and cell phone calls. Depending upon the capability of a given device, it can capture the content of that call. Let me repeat, local law enforcement agencies possess technology that can track your cell phone, reveal who you called, when you called, called, and in some cases, capture what you said. 
Law enforcement agencies have kept the use of this technology secret because many agencies sign non-disclosure agreements, typically with the FBI, when purchasing the cell phone intercept technology. This information blackout also applies to the elected officials who are responsible for that oversight. Across California, at least 11 local law enforcement agencies have the technology that we know of. The Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office recently received approval to buy such technology. However, the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors was not allowed to know anything about the technology in making the decision. In a board meeting, Supervisor Joe Simidian, and I know Joe is here this weekend, Supervisor Joe Simidian stated, we are being asked to spend $500,000 of taxpayer money and $42,000 a year thereafter for a product, the name brand which we are not sure of, a product that we have not seen, a demonstration we don't have, and we have a non-disclosure requirement as a precondition. You want us to vote and spend money, but you can't tell us more about it. Supervisors, Supervisor Simidian asked to see the device and asked the sheriff's office to give him a demonstration. The sheriff's office refused, stating that only those with badges can see the device. Well, in my view, if only badges can see technology, then we lose civilian oversight and the power of the people. Supervisor Simidian also asked to see a copy of the non-disclosure agreement. Again, he was refused. Police argue that disclosing details about the devices would harm the ability to enforce the law because adversaries could then learn about and figure out how the technology works. I argue that the secrecy harms our democracy. Our country was, has a long history of civilian oversight and Fourth Amendment protections. The ability of law enforcement agencies to obtain powerful surveillance technologies with little to no civilian oversight has the potential to fundamentally alter our democracy. We live in a post 9-11 world in which law enforcement feels the need to acquire any and all tools they think are necessary to catch criminals. But we cannot allow the desire for the latest bright and shiny new technology to blind us to the vital needs of checks and balances. I've introduced two bills to reinforce civilian oversight. The first is Senate Bill 34 deals with license plate readers. The second bill, Senate Bill 741, deals with transparency for stingray devices. Both bills require a local legislative body, that's you, to approve the use of the technology, and if approved, there must be a publicly available policy that states how, when, and for what purposes the technology will be used. I'm also co-authoring a bill by Senator Leno in San Francisco to ensure that in most cases, the police obtain a warrant from a judge before accessing a person's private information, including data, which they can do now, from private electronic devices, email, digital documents, text messages, and local information. I've been working on this issue for two years, and before me, actually, Joe Simidian as a senator was working on them. It's been an uphill battle. However strong our relationships may be with local law enforcement, you should be aware that the law enforcement community, for the most part, the police chiefs, the state sheriffs, and the rank and file have formed coalitions to oppose some of my legislation and Senator Leno's that protect our civil liberties and make sure the law keeps up with the rapid adoption of those types of technologies. The opposing coalition includes the companies that make the very devices that enable law enforcement to broaden their police powers through use of the proprietary technology, a relationship that further illustrates the need for civilian oversight. But they have resisted civilian oversight, and they have resisted transparency, and they have resisted minimum standards and restrictions. They want to keep their unfettered use of, civilian, of surveillance technologies just the way it is, keeping the rest of us, including elected officials, who have a formal oversight role in the dark. The technologies I discussed today are just two of the advanced tools that law enforcement agencies are using increasingly. They are also acquiring drones, facial recognition technology, and video surveillance. As the use of this surveillance technology proliferates, the risk of overreaching, the possibility that we forfeit some of our core liberties in pursuit of security has become more pronounced. We shouldn't sacrifice the very liberties we seek to preserve by allowing unrestricted use of these devices. Frankly, I don't know how successful I will be in Sacramento with my legislation. 
I've already been defeated once with the same issue. But all of you are here on the front lines. Those of you who are county supervisors, city council members, have the ability and the responsibility to protect the rights of your residents and to prevent overzealous policing. The technology we're talking about today is part of the first wave of next generation law enforcement tools. Please know, I'm not saying they are bad at all. I mean, they are great tools when used in the right way. I'm saying that we as elected officials have a responsibility to the public to ensure that such tools, if used, are truly used for the greater good. It is essential that we, especially those of you elected to governing boards and governing bodies in our cities and our counties, make informed decisions about whether to use them, that you know enough about the technology, what it does, how it will be used, and what rules you think are needed to manage it in considering when to use it. And of paramount importance that the public has been told of the proposals to use these tools, and that, that, haven't, that have you given your constituents a chance to share their questions and concerns about that technology. You would not install a new stop sign on a city street without a study session and a public hearing on the proposal and its potential impacts to your community. At the very least, proposals about the use of tech powerful, advanced technology by our police should be subject to the same level of scrutiny by our local governing bodies and by the residents of our communities. Everyone here today is a leader of government or in business or in our community. We all have the power to help preserve civilian oversight, our core liberties and our shared vision of a sustainable future. Thomas Paine once said, a body of men holding themselves accountable to nobody ought not to be trusted by anybody. Many police and sheriff agencies in our state are behaving as though they are not accountable to anyone. We must hold them accountable because as John Adams said, liberty once lost is lost forever. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning and share that with you. I'd really like to thank Jerry and Carol this morning in their remarks, part of the theme is we're in this together. And San Mateo County is unique in that regard, where we bring together nonprofits, labor, business, elected officials, and we get things done. That's why we're here this weekend. So let's give them both another round of applause. For more video on the 2015 Progress Seminar, go to www.pentv.tv slash videos slash specials slash Progress Seminar.